I present these journals to you as a warning. There are churches that are indistinguishable from your Christian churches. Well, until you get to the inner circle. They pray to neither Yahweh nor Jesus, even though they say they do. They pray to someone whose name I can never write. A God who loves to make himself known. But because of forces even beyond him, it is quite difficult for him to do so. A God who can give those he loves whatever he wants, but only those he loves. This isn't a conspiracy of how elites secretly serve him or how he sits in the background dictating every move. This is an account of how he's ruined my life. Forgive my arrogance in the following journal entries. Pride before the fall and all that. Welcome, losers. Today's a big day for me and you. For you, this is the start of how you get everything you want in life by reading my memoirs. And for me, this is the day I start my first and hopefully my last romantic relationship with a certain beautiful girl named Kay McKenzie. I won't go into too much detail about her because I'm sure you've heard of her. And by the time you read this, I'll be famous and so will she. She'll be married to me. Duh. Anyway, here's the most important thing for you to know about the universe. This will change your life and make my memoir sell out. Read this slowly. Come closer. I'll whisper this to you. The first commandment is the most overlooked. You shall have no other gods before me. It implies there are other gods. And oh boy does he love proving he's real. I'm not a fan of him, for reasons you'll learn later. But you might be. There are two ways we know with 100% certainty he's real. So, this one's more like a potty trick. If we try to say our god's name on camera, something will happen, and the name is never heard. This can be as simple as the camera losing audio for one second, or a deer wailing like it's been stabbed in the background to cover up the sound. I've heard both. If we try to write it, we get similar effects. Laptops shut down, ink spills, or the pencil that splits and leaps right into the eye of the writer. I've seen it all. Now here's what he does that's beyond a party trick. He is what I, to the anger of my friends, call a coupon honoring God. That means if you believe Yahweh or whoever did a miracle, any miracle, and go into one of the God's temples and tell him you have faith that Yahweh did it and state that you have faith that he can do the same, he'll do it just like that. You can be healed from cancer, legs growing back, and people being raised from the dead. I've seen it all. Where are these churches, you ask? Everywhere, really. You wouldn't spot a difference on the outside or inside on an average Sunday service. Only once you reach the inner circle is the true nature of the church revealed to you. There are some mega churches, mid-sized churches, and struggling small churches. The small churches believe they are small because they teach the true word and thus attract fewer people, and they disdain the bigger churches. The big churches don't think about the small churches until they need to give them money because they're dying. I'll let you decide who's the better church. I know many of you are asking why would a church ever be poor if you could simply ask God for whatever you want. Well, we'll get to that later. I'll give you a list of churches in the back of this book, and you can either attend them and ask God for whatever, or start a new holy war. Not my problem. I don't care either way as long as you paid for this book, which pays for my retirement. Now let me tell you about my god and my girl, because they are intertwined in this religion of mine. When I was 13, about 4 years ago, we had a special ceremony with our youth group. All of our youth group were driven by van to one of the temples. The churches are easy to find, but the temples, where the real power is, they are hard to find. This one was out in a cornfield, isolated and alone. It was not a grand thing and was closer in appearance to a shack in the woods than a grand cathedral. We exited the bus to go to the temple in a silent single file line. Talking without permission was an offense that resulted in physical punishment. We shivered in the rough wind and the cold drizzle of rain. Most of us kept our heads down to avoid the gaze of the high corn stalks. Silence was demanded, but fear was allowed, 
so our single file scurried and shook all the way to the temple. Be seated. Sharon, our youth group leader, told us and went away to who knows where. We did as we were commanded. She did not tell us to be silent, but we understood. The wind beat on the tinted windows as if it was demanding to come in. It shook the whole poorly made temple. The red carpet that lined the auditorium danced in front of my eyes. If we looked at it too long, we would swear it was not solid, but a thick liquid. Too thick for blood. The wooden pews groaned at any movement we would dare to make. Many kids have been beaten because their bench groaned too loud. So we sat in corpse-like silence and forced stillness that made my heart race around my chest until Sharon finally returned. Sharon came from the back of the sanctuary and held the hand of some kid a couple of years younger than us, maybe nine. I did not like Sharon. Everything about her screamed fake and uptight. Her static platinum hair and pink nails were too fake. Her clothes were tight, and even as a child, I wondered why she dressed like that to teach youth group. I've seen the average youth group leader you guys have for church. And no, she did not look like that. I'm not sure why she wanted to be a youth group leader. I don't think she even liked kids. Oh, well maybe that's why. You'll see what I mean. Anyway, Sharon escorted a small child between the two pews where we sat. As she walked in, the benches quieted their groans and the wind eased its assault against the door to more of a polite and creepy knock. The carpet still looked swimmable. Today, we get to feed God, Sharon said and smiled with a perky demeanor foreign to her. We all shifted in our seats and tried not to appear afraid. We forgot food. How could we feed our God without food? We forgot to bring food, and this would make God mad, our parents mad, and Sharon mad. Most of us weren't stupid, so we knew not to admit our flaws. Instead, we spoke to each other in hand signals and concerned looks to determine if anyone brought any food we could split. No one was stupid enough to admit we forgot to bring food. Except this one girl in the front row, who audibly yelped. We all turned to her. Mrs. Sharon? The girl said. Sorry, I mean, miss. The girl corrected, mid-stutter. She was shivering, maybe out of nerves, or maybe out of fear, or maybe... She was still recovering from the elements outside. Miss Sharon's smile was as hard as stone. She hated being reminded she was unmarried. Honestly, I think the girl was too oblivious to realize it. She went on, stammering all the way through. Her hands moved up and down as she spoke like the most frazzled symphony conductor ever. I'm sorry, I forgot to bring food. I will do better next time. I always write stuff like this in my planner. And I must have forgotten this time. I don't normally do this. You know I'm a good student. Miss Mackenzie, Sharon said, stone smile unbent. I didn't tell you to bring food, because I have it. A great fire leaped from the altar at the end of the hall. The altar of our god stood about nine feet tall. He had the head of a bull, the sculpted arms of an Olympian, in a furnace that served as a stomach. And that furnace roared now. We all sat in our seats, and our eyes avoided the fire. You've probably never been in the presence of real supernatural power. You feel the need to hide from it, and are haunted by an evil insignificance. Maybe you felt insignificant looking at stars. It dawns on you that you are small compared to the universe. But I bet you embraced that. I bet it made you want to see all there was of life. I bet you took risks. I bet you traveled. Well, I call this evil insignificance because it does the opposite. This power made me want to end life's search. There was too much power and too many things that were beyond me. I wanted to stay in this seat, hidden and scared, and never have to face the uncertainty of life again. My heart fled. My head danced and my mouth went dry. We were supposed to be silent, but I heard myself panting. Sharon did not mind it. She walked forward. Her heels did not clack against the carpet, but instead 
made a splashing sound as if she walked on a puddle. She dragged the kid behind her. Oh no, 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 I thought, but didn't dare say. The kid was the food. I know the kid was drugged. He had to be. Anyone with any survival instincts would have ran from her. She strode forward with confidence. Perhaps this is why she wanted to work with kids. Perhaps this was her reward. She got to feel all of our God's presence and not want to shrivel away like we wanted to. All I could think was, no, 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 the closer they got. I didn't want to watch this, but I didn't want to be next. So I had to sit there, and I was supposed to keep my eyes open, but I couldn't manage that. I'm sorry, I'm a coward, but I covered my eyes. It didn't feel right to see. That wasn't enough though. My eyes couldn't close tight enough. Bright orange light seeped in them. I squeezed with every muscle in my body, and they couldn't go tighter. Pain swarmed in the middle of my head because of the effort. Then came his screams once he was in the fire. He was so confused. I heard a what in there and so many cries for help. I opened my eyes to see if she would. She kicked him with her heel and he was pushed back into the flames. Then she laughed. Then they all laughed. And I felt sick because I didn't know what was funny. I didn't know the kid, which meant he wasn't part of the inner circle of the church. So we were told not to care about him or his safety. And that hurt me. For the past few months, I was having physical aches of pain at what I witnessed we did to unbelievers. It created a deep numbness within me for all things except me. How could I love my God or my people who would do such a thing? The other kids did not feel this way. I can't blame them, I guess. It worked out for them. They laughed and laughed and made fun of how he wiggled in the flames. They marveled at how you could see a skeleton. They mocked how loud he got, and they mocked his eventual silence. And then, the flame went out, and there was quiet, except for one person's sniffles. Sniffles that soon grew into tears, something that was frowned upon. Why should we pity something that was our God's will? The nervous girl from the front cried. She viciously wiped away tears from her face because she knew her tears were heinous, her empathy evil. She understood her own punishment would be coming. The other kids stared at her. That's what I hated the most. They didn't have the shame to turn away from her. No, they stared because they genuinely could not understand why she was crying. Or they had the sick desire to enjoy her upcoming punishment. The girl could have saved herself from this punishment. She maybe could have avoided it if she pretended that her tears were about anything else. But she kept saying, I'm sorry, I don't mean, it's just, they were so young. As Sharon walked now, the world felt the weight of her steps. I felt it again. Again, I had to be a hopeless spectator to an ugly stomach-turning spectacle. Sharon's heels clacked against the ground, resolute, to deliver a punishment. That girl was Kay McKenzie, and that's the moment I knew I loved her. I grew numb because of this world we lived in. She didn't. I fell in love with the girl because she cared even when she wasn't supposed to. Sharon delivered her punishment with malice. A swift smack to the face. You all hide your punishments on parts of the body that could be hidden. Our leaders punish us on our faces, so we can be shamed. Sharon's mission was not to stop until Kay's face was swollen and purple and Kay's tears ceased. Now, I had never done this, and I don't think I could do it again, but I made myself cry to get Sharon's attention off of Kay. A loud wail. So Sharon had to click clack her heels to me, smack me once, and then go back to Kay and keep going. Which to me is funny in a way. If you don't laugh, you cry, right? 
Eventually, Sharon grew too tired, and none of her faces became purple. Just red. Every strike from Sharon was worth it, because Kay and I became friends after. She is a small girl, and her two front teeth are big, like mine. And she talks too much, in the opinion of everyone but me, and they say the same about me. And she gets depressed sometimes, but won't tell anybody because, like me, that's not her role in life. We're here to make people laugh, and we would never burden anyone else with what makes us sad. Like me, she has a hard time expressing herself to people she's not close to, which is the saddest of tragedies for them and my saving grace, because if she did, they'd be hopelessly in love with her like me. That is the wonderful heart of Kay McKenzie, the girl I will start dating tomorrow, and then marry within the year. That's her. That's the girl I'd go to hell for. We will leave this god together, and I'll give her a life of peace where her empathy won't be punished. After that night, Kim and I did become friends. Best friends even. However, the death of the child gave us two different goals. Kay believed the child had to die because we angered God. The death of the child inspired her to attempt the Sisyphean task of pleasing this mad God. It hurt her over the years. Her hair grew small strips of grey. Her eyes had crow's feet before she was 18. She always smiled, lighting the room. But if she was a candle's flame, she was one gust away from disappearing forever. It hurt to watch. The death of the child erased my trust in our God. I wanted nothing to do with him, but I couldn't break free, physically. So I broke free, virtually. I bypassed the parental block on my phone, and the whole wide world was at my fingertips via the internet. That's where I learned about you people, dear reader, and what the outside world believes. I want to say this brought a great sense of enlightenment to me, but it made me depressed, anxious, and to be honest, self-centered. I spent a lot of time on Twitter. I amassed more knowledge than anyone else in my group. Even the adults blocked about 99% of the internet on their phones. But none of this knowledge made me happy or a better person. I became a fraud, a wise, self-centered deviant who explored all corners of the internet at night and pretended to worship this strange god in the morning. I believed I was getting away with it as well, until it was time for discipline. At our tiny private school, occasionally, the secretary would come in and announced she needed students for discipline. That meant students had done something wrong, and now they needed to be punished for it. Anything was allowed for punishment. Discipline came at random. How could you know if you did something wrong with rules such as talking without permission or being too loud at lunch? How could you ever know if you were safe? And do you think the teachers stopped taking notes once class was over? No. If they saw you commit any disciplinable action at church or even in your neighborhood, you can be sure it was reported. Before discipline, it was another lazy day in American history class. Our teacher sat on the far right and watched clips of his beloved Dallas Cowboys. We left our books open, notebooks on our desks, and pencils in our hands as we talked to one another in case Mr. Foyer told us to quiet down and actually do work. Chatter and mischief filled the room. Students bounced from desk to desk, gossiping and scheming. Who did what to who? And where? Guys untucked their uniform shirts. Girls pretended to be annoyed with guys' flirtations. I freely scrolled through my phone. This was our playground. Understand, Mr. Foyer was a terrible teacher, but his lack of interest in teaching gave us freedom. So much of our lives was monitored. Not there, though. Mrs. Dana stepped into the room. Without a word spoken, we sat in our seats. I felt smaller. The room felt tighter. I couldn't read my classmates' minds, but I knew what they were thinking. They were thinking the same thing as me. Was it my turn to be called? I could feel our previous sins in the air. They came down on us like an itchy antique blanket. Every action we had done previously was questioned. Why were we up without permission? 
Why were we talking without permission? What did she see? Was it my turn to be called? Mrs. Dana was a pretty woman and so sweet, so much of the time. She was also the woman who announced who would be disciplined today. She exhibited professionalism and grace unlike so many of our authority figures. Great smile, beautiful brown skin, and a reassuring voice. Until it wasn't. When she was not asking us to rise, to be tortured. Every sentence she said always ended in a laugh. This was the woman who helped us find our ways on the first day of class, who would compliment any fashion decision we made that still followed our strict dress code. I know she was a shoulder to cry on for Kay. Mr. Foyer rose from his seat. All right, class. I told y'all to settle down. Of course, he hadn't told us to settle down earlier. But like many of the adults, Mr. Foyer was a coward and refused to look like he was doing anything wrong. I've read people's comments to cult leaders. How could an adult be a part of hurting a child? If you asked Mrs. Dina, I think she'd say, You turn the switch in your head that thinks, off. You follow a script. We all saw her do it with astonishing results. I need to call a couple of students in for discipline. She said in a dry, authoritarian baritone in front of the whiteboard at the head of the classroom. An American flag hung in the left corner and a Christian flag in the right. Mrs. Dana scanned the classroom. Her gaze was not still and patient like normal. Her eyes wandered and were expectant. Maybe this wasn't the part she had to turn off, but was the part that was finally free. Did she enjoy that? I always felt she would say my name. I always felt guilty. Still do. There's always another sin, isn't there? I went over mine in my head and wondered if a teacher was there observing me when I thought I was alone. Tony. Jake. She didn't bother with last names. We knew who everybody was. Small school. It was always the same kids, and I was clever enough to hide my flaws. My name was seldom chosen. Jazz. Kanan. It was almost over. I never got called, so I shouldn't get called this time. Assyria? Reflexively, I found myself thanking my God again under my lungs for keeping me safe for... Seth. I didn't move. It felt too real and too cruel. I grabbed my desk and looked straight ahead at the whiteboard at the front of the class. It blurred and became hard to read. Random facts about American presidents were on there, and all smudged together in my view. My heart was running, speeding. Of course, I didn't look at any other student. There was too much shame in having my name called. Come on, let's go, Mrs. Dana said and melted into her role as a villain. There was no bend in her voice. How could she be so resolute, considering what they could do to us? That was her faith, I suppose. Seth, get up. She commanded me now. Each child was in line. I was the only one still seated. Go on up now, Seth. Take your medicine. Said our teacher, Mr. Foyer. He's still in the cult to this day. Most teachers leave and come back or die shortly after leaving. Not Mr. Foyer. He is a short, pathetic man who went along with this cult because... He'd go along with anything that padded his ego. I rose from my seat and followed. We were like funeral processions or ghost children who could not acknowledge one another. We walked in the empty halls, past the locker into the main office, and spread out around it. We circled a single chair, the one piece of furniture in the office, and cringed around it, waiting for the principal to come and deliver our punishment and state our crimes. Many of us visibly cowered, my chest pulsed. The girl beside me cried quietly, and the boy beside me kept saying, Fuck. Fuck. It's odd. I don't even feel comfortable saying their names now. I would never tell you who cried before they were punished, or who said one of the bad words. There was a certain code we all lived by. What happened in discipline stayed in discipline. The waiting was not the worst part. And yet, I felt we were waiting a long time and the fear in me was subsiding. 
Could I really be that lucky that discipline was cancelled today? Mrs. Tina pretended to busy herself around her desk. She held the folder of whatever our crimes were and smacked it against the desk. Where is Principal Frederick? She asked the heir. She then turned to us and the glimmer came back in her eye. Maybe he's giving everyone mercy today? And I could see she wanted that. She didn't want to see us hurt. I'll never forget how her smile stretched from cheek to cheek because it contorted right after. Oh, Principal Frederick, she said, and the sternness returned. Then came the fear. I never knew someone could stand so still. Principal Frederick appeared at the end of the office, seemingly out of nowhere. His eyes were closed, shut tight. They reminded me of the effort an honest kid puts into closing their eyes while playing hide-and-go-seek. His black suit and tie were soaked. I assume with sweat, because that's what his face was covered in. Principal Frederick? Mrs. Dana said as we scattered, not bold enough to leave the room, but bold enough to squish ourselves into corners of the small office. Something was not right. This was not normal discipline. How'd you get here? There's only one door. Mrs. Dana looked behind her, as if that would confirm this magic. Yes. Principal Frederick confirmed and then touched his chest and moved his fingers across his wet white shirt until he found his tie and adjusted it. Yes, uh, normally. I have. He sputtered and tears ran down his face. Principal Frederick? That's all Mrs. Dana could do. Repeat his name dumbly. I looked through a door. I was not invited to go in. He cried without remorse. With a freedom I have never seen a man cry with. Like a newborn baby's cry. He stepped forward and behind him. I saw the impossible. A grey wooden door that had not been there before. Principal Frederick strode forward. Tears flowed down his face and made his cheeks glisten. Snot poured from his nose into his mouth, which polluted every word he said. I have been told Seth must go through the door. He opened his eyes and his two eyeballs dropped out of their sockets. They plopped down. They thought like rocks. Eyes do not thought like rocks, nor could they just fall out of a face. One rolled forward and the other backward. One crashed into the door and sounded like a marble hitting solid oak. The pupil faced us. Faced me. Everyone in the room screamed. We were brainwashed in our cult to witness so much of the unordinary, bizarre, and evil. But this was out of the ordinary. We froze. I think someone pissed themselves beside me. Every kid in there cried freely. I apologize. I apologize. The principal said. I saw something I should not have seen, so I was given another pair of eyes. Where is Seth? Where is he? The principal asked and dropped to his knees. No one answered. Thank everything, no one answered. On his knees and groped and sniffed, grabbing the first kid he felt and pulling them close to his nose. Where is he? I can smell him, he said. Seth? Go in the door, Mrs. Dana asked. She still had kindness in her. It was a request. I shook my head at her, a desperate and pleading no. The other one of Principal Frederick's eyes stopped rolling and landed at my feet. It was not an eye. It was more like a rock, expertly painted to imitate an eye. Seth? For us. Please, Mrs. Dana said. Principal Frederick pulled at another student, gave them another whiff, and disregarded them against the wall. Again, I shook my head no, and that set her off. Get off the wall and go in! She screeched, a demonic, eardrum popping and vocal cord violating screech. Maybe she was as scared as I was then, and her scream to me was the plea of someone who was trying to save her own life. I do know one thing though, she followed her faith. She believed, with 100% certainty, that she was doing the right thing. She rushed to me, clapped her hands and screamed. He's here, Principal Frederick! He's here! 
she yelled, and Principal Frederick leaped on me. His knee slammed into his own eye on the floor. It exploded with more vigor than a buck under a foot. It burst open on my legs and feet. The door, Mrs. Dana! The door! He bellowed, and Mrs. Dana ran for it, opened the door, and closed her eyes. She refused to look where she tempted me to go. I clawed for anyone. The other kids deserted. Their screams echoed off the halls. Principal Frederick squeezed me tighter, his wet arms constricted against my throat. I wanted to rebel against all I was ever told then. I wanted to kick an adult, bite an adult. I wanted to free myself, but I couldn't. Maybe it was my home training. I just couldn't. I don't know how Principal Frederick felt during the ordeal, and for some reason, that concerned me. He was crying when he picked me up, and he kept crying. The last thing I saw before Principal Frederick tossed me inside was Mrs. Dana stepping on his other eye. Smoke scraped my taste buds, buried me in its grasp, and mystified the world around me. And there was a beautiful orange light in the distance I couldn't resist going to. Walking was out of the question. I try heaved and crawled forward. I was not alone. To my left and right, I heard footsteps and jingles. The keys. I was going in the same direction as Dim. I made myself small and tried to remain quiet and go to the light. I needed that glow. My heart races in anticipation right now, just writing about that light. We weren't so different from mosquitoes, you and I. There's a certain type of light we are drawn to. We must see, even if it kills us. I still try to recreate that light. I tried everything I can. Don't judge me. You don't know what it's like to have your soul, mind, and body all want something at one time. And don't talk to me about love, because that light is stronger than love. This light is in your genes. As I crawled to the light, the smoke revealed glimpses of my fellow travelers. I saw bare feet. I saw bovine feet. And I saw cold metal. I did finally reach a destination of sorts. I saw someone, still maybe miles away from the great orange light, set a familiar face. Sharon. Sharon sat straight ahead. I say she sat, but it appeared like she was sitting on nothing. I didn't speak. I didn't move. I was at her mercy. The adrenaline left my body. Deep insignificance possessed me. I was looking at something better than me. Something beyond me. I respected no god at the time, and I stayed down and bowed to this. Again, it was like observing the stars. No, worse than that. This was like being tossed in space, floating, powerless, unable to die, and being pulled toward a giant celestial body. A knowing that you should not be there, and a sense that you cannot leave. Miss Sharon? I asked. Something like that. I didn't know how to respond. So she spoke again. You'll never believe who I was having a lovely conversation with. I... I don't know. Oh, guess. Come on. It's the answer that's never wrong. I said the name of our god. Yes, she practically moaned out, and he told me all about you and what you've been doing. She tilted her head at me like she wanted me to speak, as if she wanted me to confess something. I'm sorry, I said, but he didn't have to, you know, because we can smell it on you. We can smell your sin. Right then, a putrid smell leaked from my skin. It's hard to describe. Really unique. Not the typical smell of garbage or a skunk, but the stench of weak old death, maybe. It poured from my skin and rose into the air. I remember how angry it made me at myself. I scratched myself and begged it to stop. I dropped to the black ground and rolled like the smell could leave me. But I could see it coming from my pores. It was an ugly green that zigzagged in the air and was thick as toothpaste. We all know what you are, 
she said and rose. Her heels clacked as she walked toward me. Our Lord wants you to know, we can smell you. Everyone can, even if they wouldn't tell you. Why am I here? I asked. Sharon snapped her fingers. A great wind ran through the room and cleared the smoke. To my left and right were lines of beings shackled together. Some were people, but not all of them. There were humans of all hues, hues that don't exist on this planet. Bovine people who walked on two legs, and four-legged things with the bodies and feet of cows, and the faces of people just like you and me. I was confused and horrified. I witnessed what, to my eyes, were abominations and impossible mistakes of nature tied to normal people. And forgive me, but I know now that those things had souls and thoughts of their own. But they were hideous, frightening monsters. I let out a stream of curses as soon as I saw them. And the chains. There were slaves. Legs chained, necks chained, and wrists chained to the person ahead of them. Why am I here? Sharon smacked her hands together. A chorus of cries rang out. I heard the begging and burning of the victims of the giant flame. I heard the moans for freedom. They spoke in different languages, and I was cursed to understand them. One year! I only had one year alive! Another bargained to nothing. Please! Please! I thought I deserved this, but I don't! Please! Please! Another said, Save my children. Go back and tell my children. A father begged. Sharon nodded her head. The smoke returned, and the moans were silenced. Across universes, Sharon said, This is the way things are. You live and die. To feed them. Look how they crawl to it. Look how you're drawn to it. This is the way of the world. This is how you and everyone you love ends up. Why did you show me that? Because you belong to him. Your parents prayed and dedicated you to him. And our God wants no lost sheep. Just like the other guy. She winks. You'll obey him, right? From here on? Yes, yes, yes. Good. Now get in line. No, please. No. Let me go back and I'll serve him, I swear. He doesn't want that anymore. You're too far gone. You're corrupted. Get up and get in line. No, no, no! I screamed, shut my eyes, and praised to be grabbed. I would fight. I could do it this time. I could fight. The grab never came. Sharon stood over me, unamused. Is that your final decision? She asked. I, uh, yes. Then go. Every god must honor free will after all. But when you desire this, it will not come to you easily then. You are cursed and don't know it. You will be hated for all the days of your life. You will be rejected by all and be denied every good thing you see before you. Others will have it and you can never taste it. Because we smell you. We smell what's wrong with you. We know you are wrong. I didn't raise my head. I buried it deeper into the floor. I heard the sound of her heels walking away from me and into the darkness. You may go now. And I did. I ran back to where I came from, anxious to escape. Anxious to be away from everybody. Because she did it. She confirmed a fear of mine for so long. I was an awful person. I dared explore outside the realm of our god, and I believed that was so wrong then. It was always in the back of my head that everyone knows, everyone knows that I'm wrong. And that is how my life would go. For some reason or another, the idea of anyone getting close to me repulsed everyone in my school or church. I was branded creepy, or a lot to deal with. Or, just something off about him. People never felt the need to whisper when ridiculing me. My parents spent as little time as they could with me. I was rejected in every attempt to form a romantic relationship. 
I had to beg to get into any groups for group projects, and I was mocked for nearly every action I took. I considered so often. Throughout it though, I had one friend, the same girl I told you about before, Kay McKenzie. I love her very much and promise to take her out of here. So, after much research online via YouTube Shorts and TikTok, I know how I'll make my fortune. I will move out and start my career as soon as I can. I will be following the dropshipper to influencer pipeline. I'll start as a dropshipper, make as much money as I can, and then once I have enough, or enough to appear like I'm rich, I'll start a TikTok shaming people for being poor and then charging to teach them the never before seen tips to dropship. I've seen enough of the content you guys make. I know it'll work. And the good part of it for me is that I don't even have to make the money dropshipping. I'll start Walter Whiting if I have to and say I got it from dropshipping. Once I'm rich, I'll charge everyone and their mother to learn my secret. Don't take it personally. Like I said, I've got to get enough money to get Kay and me out of this cult, so I'm going to buy us a big house in the mountains. You can hate me for it. I get it. After all, if you're buying my memoir, you might have bought one of the classes I sold. Sorry. Honestly though, if you had a friend like Kay, you might do the same thing. I don't know if anyone else gets this or got this, but do you ever feel protective of your friends when you know you're about to leave them? You know it'll be over soon, and this is as good as it gets. I always wish for the I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but here feeling, and I get it when I'm with Kay. And as you know, I do not deserve it, because she's a way better person than me. I do not have faith like she does, and my goals will never be as pure. Yet, I am loved anyway. And that's her mistake. She's too trusting and too kind. Trusting is the cousin to gullible, and gullible is married to used, abused, and thrown away like garbage. She'll have to go experience the real world eventually, where people will tear her apart simply because it's funny. So, after I take the best girl I know on a few dates, I'll ask her to marry me and we'll leave this little church. The next entry you read from me will be me reporting the best day of my life. When I knocked on Kay's door, I wasn't greeted by Kay or her parents. I was greeted by Sharon. I was told she would be escorting me to Kay and that our god was making a special appearance on earth in one of the temples he owns. We hopped in her car and rode in silence for 30 minutes. Sharon stopped the car. I shifted in my seat behind her in the back, nervous and scared for my potential fate. We were at the top of a hill that overlooked a valley filled with trees. That was where our god was. That was where my girlfriend would be. Sharon? Can you bring me closer? No. She droned in faint boredom, but I heard the joy in her voice at my pleading. I think I'll stop here and you can figure it out yourself. Hmm. A calmness came on me, the type of calm that could only arrive through an unadulterated revolutionary choice. Mute and methodic, I began to slip the belt from my pants. Sharon? I spoke her name again. I was surprised at myself and the lack of anger I felt. What? She bit back like me calling her name was another sin. Can you look at me please, Sharon? She glared at me for a second via the rearview mirror. I'm not sure what she saw when she saw me, but I know she's afraid of it. She gave an uncharacteristically skittish glance and then looked ahead. You hurt us so much as children. Do you understand that? You hurt yourselves. No, Sharon. You don't understand. This church, the school, is a prison for us. There are things you've done to us that we aren't healing from. Will it ever end, Sharon? Sharon, can you please look at me? This is important. No. She shut the door on both questions. Sharon, you are not a good person. You are hurting people. It felt foolish, so dumb and lame, trying to reason with her. Why would Sharon ever care about right and wrong? 
Sharon raised her eyes to the mirror to look at me. She had so much makeup on. It looked like an extra layer of flesh on her face, and it still doesn't cover her ugly black mole. Her dark red lips opened to sigh with the relief of a criminal finally caught. I felt God's foot on my neck. She said and sighed again. And everything I've done after that is to avoid feeling that helpless ever again. It is what it is. And with that confession, I wrapped my belt around her neck and pulled her against her seat. She choked and gasped for air. She was evil. I want you to know that. I did not enjoy watching her struggle. She scratched at my belt. Her nails ripped crooked lines in it until they chipped and chattered and made crick 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 sounds as they fell to the floor. She begged for air. They'll know it was you. They're going to kill you. No, they won't. I cried as I said it. It isn't a fun thing to take a life. The cult will never see me again. I'm going to get my girlfriend. And then, I'm going to kill your god. (coughs) Was all she could say. And now, she found my eyes in the mirror. Now we saw each other. Her makeup ran off her face. She looked clownish. My grip loosened, and I strained myself to make myself finish the job. But it was hard to summon the strength to do it, because I understood what she was. She was a hostage with a mask on. A mask of makeup, malevolent authority, and bitter discipline. In our cult, our god's name is spread generationally in families. To have a child is to have value. Sharon's one goal in life, like all women in my cult's goal in life, was to get married. She was 40 and unwed. I know that hurt her. I know she felt she had no value and feared our people in our cult would look at her with shame and wrath. So she had to go beyond being a mere apostle. She had to be the most loyal servant, and that's what made her a monster. I loosened my grip. It's hard to hate someone when you start seeing their whole story. That gave Sharon a chance to speak. Seth, please, I don't want to die. I want to be a mother first. Her last words were gargled cries about motherhood. It took more than one try to lift her dead body. I hopped in the car and drove down the hill to save my girlfriend and kill their god. At the bottom of the cliff, I got out of the car. I faced the forest. It seemed to beg for me not to enter. The top of the trees blocked out any moonlight. The only path I saw forward was revealed to me by the oval glow of my phone's flashlight. Everything on the outskirts might as well have been invisible. I wrapped my belt across my hand until the belt was tight and the buckle was on my knuckle, and I put the keys in between my fingers on my other hand like Wolverine, and walked on. It was an odd death feeling that night. No bugs squirmed around me, no squirrels scurried, and no bird squawked goodnight. A god walked on earth. That tends to change things. But to be clear, the forest was not silent. No, there were those who wanted to be close to our god, and this would be their chance. However, like Moses on the mountain, there is a cost to seeing the face of every god. There were at least twenty or so, maybe thirty-nine, our god's holy number, men and women who grazed in the woods on all fours like cattle. They wore the finest watches, necklaces, and suits, dresses tailored to their Greek statuesque bodies. Muscular men and thin women with full heads of long hair and previously white teeth stained by dirt. They were so happy. I went deeper into the forest. The wind spoke. It sang praises to our god, and the rest of the world was muted in reply. I went deeper into the forest. The trees changed. They smelled like steak and turned into flash slabs of brown meat with pinkish undertones. Flies flew around them. I went deeper into the forest. Above me, the leaves had transformed to $100 bills and rained down to the floor. This didn't even excite me. I am naturally selfish and only think about money 95% of the time. 
but I wanted her. I wanted to hold her hand and whisk her out of there. I opened my mouth to yell her name, and all I heard was the wind praising the name of our God. Frustrated, I paused and shone my light to my right and left. To my left, there were three dead bodies stacked on top of one another. Further left stood a man with money in each hand and a pile of money behind him. He crouched in front of his money, and his lips crawled into an evil curve. Blood dripped from his hands. No, no! I yelled and waved my hands at him to signal that I didn't want his money. I was not like the others he killed. The chilling and worshipping wind blocked the words from reaching his ears. He charged me. His fist whipped across my face. I leaned back to avoid contact. I kicked his chest and forced him back. He did not drop the money. Stop! The scream was useless and sad. The wind's song of our God's goodness was the only thing that could be heard. His arms flailed in random and unorthodox strikes. Right, left, right, right, right. He was a fighter. The three dead bodies were evidence of that. But he was also tired. Again, three dead bodies. With a handful of keys, I scratched across his face. A warning. I raised my hands to surrender. I didn't want to fight anyone else. He boomed forward. Like I said earlier, he was a tired fighter. Too tired to dodge. My hand of keys went straight into his neck. He howled and paused. I used that time to get behind him and wrap my belt around his neck. Again, I strangled another one of his followers. His body dropped to the floor. He did not stir. The wind died. I could hear myself breathe. It was harsh, heavy, and barbaric. Someone ran behind me. I turned around and saw the love of my life. Yay! Kay sat and smiled in her goofy way. A big and awkward smile that always reached her eyes. Her two front teeth reminded me of a happy rabbit. She started stuttering like she always does when she's too nervous or excited. I, I, I knew it was you. And I was worried you might get hurt. So I, I, I ran here to save you. I was going to. She throws the worst punch-kick combo I've ever seen in my life. Something like that, probably. Glad I wasn't relying on that. I joked. She rushed over and hugged me. And it felt like home. Come on, let's grab the money and go. She ignores me and snuggles further into my chest. No, I scolded. I'm serious, we need to go. She says something I can't hear into my chest. What? I ask. I'm not going... I'm going elsewhere. I pull her off me and look into her eyes. Okay, where are we going then? S -s Seth, you can't come. She whispered that part. He said, you can't come. I'm going with him. No, 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 you don't have to do that. Look, look, I have a plan where we can get out of here. And I'll do dropshipping and, and if that doesn't work... I can sell drugs. I will do anything. I... I don't want to live like that, she said. I want to do more for the world than drop ship or sell drugs. I sensed myself losing her. An invisible wall was coming up between us. I got desperate. A kid died. I scolded. A kid died because of your god. The one you're going with. He was burned. Kids die every day. At least he saves kids sometimes. He gives us the option to actually make real change in the world. How many people has he healed? How many people has he raised from the dead? But all of this? Look at all of this. I pointed back to the woods. To the weirdness. The abominations. What? People loving money and killing for it? People willing to be pigs for the chance to have pearls? All of that happens without him. I am, well, I don't mean to sound harsh, but he's offering world-changing knowledge. I'm going to explore other worlds with him and help people and learn. I, I, 
I can't stay here and waste my life with you. I was speechless. I love you, she said, and I wasn't sure if that was true anymore, at least not in the way I wanted. But I love other people too, and I want to help them. He's allowing me to do that. But, but, please don't leave me. She just smiled. A tear did flow down her cheek, but I knew what was going to happen. And I had to treat her like everyone else that hated me, hurt me, and rejected me. I couldn't show her that I wanted to cry. Instead, I stared into her eyes and tried to remember them, because I doubted I could see them again. I couldn't let her know it felt like my heart was tearing. So I stood tall and focused on deep breaths. I couldn't let her know my head swam at the thought of losing her. So I nodded once to acknowledge I understood her. Then, once she left to go in the woods, I got on my knees and begged for my community's God to forgive me. I was ready for my demise now. I was ready to go into the light. He did not answer. <laughs>